Welcome to another episode of The Local Dive. This is Alex Scott, joined by Dean and Sarah, Jacob Baldry, and Ashlyn Portero for the last domestic Hello. Local Dive. Live hey, from hey. Sessions Row. We'll be, we'll be international I'm so next disheveled. episode. I'm so disheveled by that, I forgot my LaCroix, so here we are. <laughs> <laughs> um, how's everybody doing? It's, um, with the time we're recording this, is like the three days of horrible weather in Tallahassee, so... It is really bad. I'm better than the weather, though. I'm That's good. good. I'm doing well. I'm thankful for the rain, because it's washing all the pollen away. We've had a uh, just a great few Sundays at church, and mm-hmm. things are really rolling, and uh, we're in Book Revelation, going through the seven churches... Just in time Just for in time, time for change time change spring break. Spring break. Oh, gosh. So yeah, so time change is the first weekend of spring break. Yes. Yes. Wow. Nothing kills momentum quite rob- like spring break. Might as break well get it all out of the way in the same Sunday, though. Yeah, for it's sure. Robbing me of an hour in America. That's right. Hey, <laughs> want that hour back. <laughs> no. They're just Seriously. trying to get you. They're just trying to get you that much closer to London. <laughs> I'm going to come back in October. How, how many hours ahead is London? Um, in normal times, so their time change is usually a couple of weeks off from ours, uh, which (laughs) makes exactly makes no sense. Um, It's the science. I'm going to walk down to the prime meridian. Does that even have anything to do with it? I should know these things. Yeah, it's kind of far. I'd I'd Uber the bank here in town. Okay. Oh, sorry. (laughs) Terrible joke. (laughs) That was prime meridian bank. That was a nice local joke. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. Um, Um, But normally London is five hours. So really not. I, I was like, there's really not that many hours in the day when like we all won't be communicating at the same time you know what i mean okay yeah because you're gonna stay up late a little bit too yeah i'm a night owl okay good i'm a night owl so so that like works well and i'm not really a morning person and so that will be great because it'll already be lunchtime for me our our group tech still works over there right (laughs) we'll be we'll be able to we'll be able to talk to ashlyn before 8 a.m eastern time because she'll be five hours ahead. So yeah. she'll be in her talking yeah, window see, everybody at that point. Wins. <laughs> everybody um, wins. For anybody who doesn't know that, Ashlyn doesn't like to be talked to that before 8 a.m. Um, it's not entirely true, but it's kind of true. It's, it is kind of true. Yeah. yeah. So like, actually, like, on my like those awful 6 a.m. out of Tallahassee Delta flight, we uh-huh. have to be there at 5 or like 5.25 now that I pre-check. But um, I can actually... 5.15 if you want to check your bag. There's no one I can really text or talk to then. I'd feel bad like waking them up or they're at Orange Theory or wherever. I, Ashlyn's up. And I'll she's already there. got her day going. She's working. She's... Yeah. All right. Yeah. Yeah, you can text me. There it is. I'll be ready to go. All right. Well, uh, sorry. We just had to kind of like... It's all good. It, it was, was like therapeutic for like five. Yeah, it was yeah, well, I don't know where we were hey, everybody. going with any of that. <laughs> no, it was just the I intro. I think we kind of all forgot we were on a podcast um, for a second. So, uh, People not, are going to be like, we enjoy banter, but this is like taking it to new levels. This is no longer interesting. Yeah, it's like, guys, we know she's going to be gone next week, but like, come on. Um, get to the get to the good stuff. Um, which, speaking of good stuff, we've got a great show, uh, we think, ahead. And uh, <laughs> so for the shallow end, uh, right now... Now gas is uh, expensive, it's, it's um, a little pricey. and there's a lot of things that I'm probably unqualified to talk about on why that is. And then there's the whole, you know, Russia Ukraine conflict and lots of other things probably driving driving that. But it's expensive, and uh, we're not gonna be the old man that shouts at the wind. Um, but what we're, is, we're what just gonna shout mean? at we're just gonna shout at Washington instead. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, but. Uh, There's a reason we're in the shallow end right now. <laughs> in, in the spirit of gas being expensive, we thought it would be fun to talk about what are things that you could buy for either a, the cost of a gallon of gas, which I think the national average right now is like four twenty nine or something like that, and um, and then uh, or what would what could you buy for what it costs to fill up your tank? Yes. So because uh, okay. you know it's well more than double what it was like a year ago. Um, Well, in a past life, when I drank Diet Coke, I could have bought at least four McDonald's Diet Cokes, which I could have drank all in. Is that right? Could have drank. That that was was Friday. Could have consumed. Yeah, that was Friday. Uh, in In one purchase for one gallon. So... That would have gone a long way for me. Yeah. Uh, now I can buy almost a whole coffee because I'm I'm not like a plain coffee drinker. So I'll get my like decaf latte, which is the biggest waste of it's probably more probably more of a waste of money than gas. Yeah. Well, definitely because I need gas to get where I'm going. But caffeine fuels you. But I don't drink caffeine. Oh yeah, that's right. It's now decaf. it's decaf. Oh, sorry. Yes, yeah, so I'm paying for like coffee flavored water right now, but it's, you know what it is. And so. some almond milk or yeah, alternative milk, a bit whatever. Funny. Yeah. Woke milk. Woke milk. Woke milk. Oh my gosh. <laughs> um, <laughs> how, how much would it cost to fill up your car? Um, 
I just got gas the other day and it was like $50, which when I first got my car, it was probably about $27 or $28. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, you know, you can do a lot with $50. I can yeah. buy a lot of books, you know. That's like five Food Glorious Food desserts. Yeah. Half a pair of running shoes. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> you get one foot. <laughs> Yeah. So, so I don't even have like some big, I want to show you how Southern I am truck. I, I just have like a Titan, right? So it's not some kind of, you know, beast of a truck. It's still a truck, but it costs me 70 something now, maybe yeah. pushing 80 to fill it up. And it's not some massive truck. And I mean, it's that's, probably more than that now. Now, yeah, I haven't, I haven't filled it up since. Yeah. And so I would say I, I could sit like behind third base at a major league baseball game mm-hmm. <laughs> for what it costs to <laughs> fill up a truck one time, you know, like, yeah, I mean, seriously, I, yeah. I could, you know, you could, I could almost just three tanks of driving would pay for my Miami hurricane season tickets for my whole family. That's like, crazy. Like, for, like the three tickets I have for me and the two boys yeah. cost as much as filling up my truck three times. <laughs> it's just crazy. Which is how many times you have to fill it up to go down there and back. Oh, I know. I usually rent a little crap <laughs> car. <laughs> yeah. It's cheaper, but now it doesn't matter almost. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's, it's wild. It, yeah. The things. Yeah. You could, I mean, just like a little bit of gas, you could go out of town. Like, like what it costs. I mean, you could get a plane ticket. Yeah. For like three tanks of gas, you could fly southwest somewhere. Or something how like many, that. how many uh, green teas can you get for a gallon of gas? Like two. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Those are Trenta. Yeah, actually, uh, no, it's about the same. <laughs> yeah, Prices well, went up. It's actually the same. It's one to one. The tea, the, tea, the Trenta tea yeah, is now going up. is now over four dollars. Okay, quest, quick question. Trenta tea and gasoline. Is the Trenta tea always unsweetened? It is now. Okay, that was a change I wasn't aware yes. of because today I when I ordered your tea, it said. Or I said, you know, unsweetened, and then they didn't put it on the board. And I'm like very big on you always double check the order at a fast food restaurant <laughs> and you know, slash Starbucks. And so I was like, you know, unsweetened. And they, the girl, you know, very directly was like, it already is unsweetened. And I was like, okay. See, sorry. I still say it when I order it just in case. Okay. Yeah. Because I don't like the sweetener and it's just like a little too much. But yeah, it's over four bucks now. Yeah. That's is, that's sad. So thank you for my tea earlier, Ashton. It's over four dollars for my tea. And and thank God you get free refills. Yes, I do. Thankfully, uh, all over town. Gold, gold stars. Um, I could get one, basically one fillet of fish for a gallon of gas, and I know that because I had one yesterday for lunch, <laughs> and so it's just fresh, fresh on the mind. Um, or uh, I'm trying to think like I don't really buy that many things that are like under, unless it's like fast food, like under four dollars. I just I don't know like what do you I mean. If you're regularly buying things under four dollars, like under four dollars, <laughs> I think you're like you frequent the Dollar Tree too much, yeah, probably. Yeah, that's true. Um, but you know, four things at the well, I don't even you, now it's like three things because I think the Dollar Tree is a dollar twenty-five. Um, oh yeah, I did hear in, that. Even inflation the tree. hit the Dollar Tree. Um, so <laughs> for a it's tank a of gas, <laughs> I mean, yeah, I mean, I'm, I think my tank's twenty-four gallons, so you know. 20 yeah 24 so i'm just under like i'm right around 100 bucks a tank yeah. um which is not fun um Jeez. so are, is anybody driving less like has it changed no. your patterns no definitely not, not at all yeah what do you do i mean you got to do things you got to do your right. life yeah, you gotta, <laughs> you gotta drive. It's, it's like it's what it is yeah um jacob how many uh protein shakes could you get for a tank of gas I don't know how many protein shakes, but I could get seven months of gym, gym memberships with how much I'm spending on gas. <laughs> that's, wow. that's, that's pretty wild. That is that's pretty a wild. Good, that's a good perspective. No. Now that, but you're you're at like that's like a Planet Fitness gym membership, right. not yes. like a bougie a premier boutique or fitness. Right. Yeah. yeah, I but could still. watch um, for one tank of gas. I could watch three or four months of PBS Masterpiece. So <laughs> there you go. I don't think I know what that is. Awesome. You, you probably need to know so that you can relate. You're, oh, this is true. Yeah. If you're a grandma, you know probably what that is. Pat Scott knows what that is. Yeah. Shout oh, she to, sure shout does. Shout out to Alex's mother. Yeah. She, she's a nice lady. Um, Who on St. Patrick's Day always wears orange because she's Protestant. Yes, that's I appreciate fair. That. She that's does. That's very true. That she does. Amazing. I appreciate yeah, the she conviction. She says the, the, the green is for the Catholics. So, and she five, ain't Catholic. Five solas. Here we go. Um, Pat wow. standing strong. Yeah. All you, right. You, you, be, you better believe it. Um, Get it, Pat. So, um, okay. Uh, there, I had one other gas question, uh, and I've totally fr- oh has anybody had to swipe twice like has anybody hit the limit like on filling up you know because like a lot of the gas stations like they only authorize your card up to like seventy five dollars or anything no, that does not happen to me nope okay. I'm, i have a I'm feeling it might yet. it might for me yeah maybe that's for you gonna guys. be a painful day truck guys it's brutal <laughs> big truck guys <laughs> yeah. um, big truck uh, energy that's right. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm medium truck guy i'm like i'm, I'm yankee truck <laughs> 
I am definitely like small mid-size SUV energy. <laughs> <laughs> She's got so- soccer, soccer mom energy over yeah, here. Yeah. <laughs> no, her, no, because that's no, like big. big no. SUV. Oh, yeah, that's, oh, yeah, that's yeah, sorry about that. I'm not driving like the Tahoe boat or anything. Yeah. True. So, all right. Well, hopefully, y'all are enjoying or not enjoying the gas prices, but you know, are surviving the gas prices. And um, may you enjoy lots of things that would cost what it would cost to fill up a tank of gas or whatever. I don't know. That was a terrible transition. <laughs> um, so anyways, <laughs> moving on to the deep dive. Uh, we uh, Two weeks ago, uh, when uh, we were all together last, we talked about uh, culture class. And uh, we've uh, decided to kind of do a part two to continue unpacking uh, some of that. So uh, maybe uh, I know one of the things Dean you had asked in the last one was for kind of us to unpack uh, some of our, our talks as each of us gave yeah. one. Um, so what, as, as you think about that, what are some things that maybe uh, stick out and that you think would be valuable for us to, to flesh out? Yeah, I think um, Alex, what for your talk you did. So Ashlyn did the kind of, Hey, here's who we are. And I think it's important just to, for any church or even organization to be able to say that this is what we're about. This is what we do. Uh, so again, yes, we're a church. Yes, we gather people, but like, what is it really about? And I think that's always just important to nail down. And then Alex, you, it wasn't all, it wasn't all negative, but part of that is also understanding what we are not, mm-hmm. because we're going to figure out what something is. It's also important to know what something is not. And you kind of helped us go, okay, here's some examples of what we don't do and also do as a result of, of the culture. So I, I think those things were really good kickoffs back to back weeks for the staff because a lot of them to go, okay, this is okay. This is what they're talking about. This is the culture class. And then we went after that the rest of the time more into stories of people, you know, like Sarah Stevens, who now is our programming director uh, and is in her, you know, early 30s, started here as a college student, as an intern, you know, over a, well over a decade ago. Uh, so to tell her city church story of, of what this church is and what it's become and what uh, drew her in the early days, what, what still matters to us, uh, th- those type of things. So I think that, it was really important the first two days to really clarify who's who we are and who we aren't. Here's what that means. And then the rest of it got to be, okay, here's how that plays out Mm -hmm. into people's daily lives and daily stories. And now here's what we expect you to champion as a staff member here concerning our culture and what we do. Ashlyn, from your talk on DNA, one of the things that you um, said was, uh, sorry, scrolling up and I'll get there, but um, that, you know, it was sort of like it was our, you know, our DNA, who we are is our sort of genetic instruction on how we develop, function, grow and reproduce as an organization um, and that it, it doesn't really change. You know, so there are some things that the expression of our DNA might change, but like who we are doesn't. Can you kind of just talk about like some of the uh, maybe like the high level points of who we are? Right? Like what is our what is City Church DNA? Yeah. Uh, do you want me to get into like core value stuff too? Sure. Okay. Um, so that was, I used uh, several years ago in some of our strategic leadership meetings, we came up with, uh, or not really came up with, but you know, we defined, we defined five core values, uh, for our church and for our staff team. And, uh, I'll get to why I think those are really important in regards to culture conversations in a minute, but those are, uh, gospel centrality, um, commitment to making disciples, reaching the next generation, living on mission, and generosity. <laughs> now I'm missing the fourth the I fifth am Ron one. Burgundy question mark. Um, yeah. But what we talked about with that is no, submission to the authority of scripture. Sorry. Um, which think, includes generosity. Yeah, which includes <laughs> generosity. I was like, that doesn't sound quite right. Yeah. So, go- so let me just say it. Gospel centrality, submission to the authority of scripture, commitment to making disciples, reaching the next generation, living on mission. So those okay. five things are have been and I think always will be, Lord willing, the sort of um, guiding principles, if you want to call them that, and just foundational qualities of uh, what we want to be as a church, as people who are living faithfully for the mission and the glory of God. Um, And so we, so I used that to kind of guide this first talk about who we are and why, why we do what we do and how we do what we do. And I think that matters because at the end of the day, like we're trying to develop a culture that guides people, you know, like culture is about people um, and organizations are made up of people. And we're trying to guide people in a specific culture to see those things actually come to fruition and to see that like those values replicated throughout our whole church. And so you've got to have people who, um, you know, fit the type of culture that, you know, 
we are looking at Tallahassee and saying, what is going to reach the people here? Knowing that not everyone is the same exact person, but there are, there are general principles and there are general qualities that are going to allow us to be more intentional to reach the people that we want to reach. And so we want to cultivate that culture, but we want to cultivate it towards something, you know? And, and so I think that's an important thing too, is that your company can have a culture, but, but you want to know why it has that specific culture. And I think for us, it's because we want to see those core values um, really drive everything that we're doing and and mark everything that we're doing. And so that was kind of what I was trying to get at get at in all of that. Um, and what was the other part of the question you asked me? That I think that you covered. It okay. was just sort of like what are they and why like why is that important for kind of how we think about culture and how we reproduce ourselves. Yeah. Kind of- so I, I think with culture, you know, you're trying to you're trying to help people develop a a common like the the phrase I keep coming back to is like a way of being you know which I think does I think does capture in a sense what culture is within a community that that there are going to be different shades of you know that that color or that personality or that that way of being um not every person is going to be the the exact same um but the but if people are the culture carriers then they're all going to be kind of working in line together to accomplish Uh, the same purposes and the way that I mean I think that's something that we value is not just what we're doing but that the way we go about doing it is is in a certain way Um, and that is difficult because in one sense you have to drill down really far into that but then you also want to give freedom in that too right like you're Mm -hmm. not trying to create carbon copies of the same people um, but especially when you're trying to build things and when you're you're trying to um, you know I mean of course ministry is is all about stepping out in faith, but also using what the Lord has given you and and the people resources that you have to, to build and to do new things, um, that there's so much risk involved in that. And you, you have to have high trust, which is a part of your culture, but you also have to have people who, uh, you know, that you can, you know, and Dean, you do a great job of this, that that you can send out and and commission to do certain things. And, um, you know that it's going to kind of go a certain way because you have those people who are all bought into your culture. That's well said. Yeah, and you're invited to come onto a team, right? Right. You don't get to create your own offense when you go join a football team. Mm-hmm. You know, you go and join the existing offense. Unless you're then, Tom Brady. Unless you're Tom Brady, he is the offense. But so, but and, and you you bring your gifts and your abilities, your talents, the things that God's given you to that team. Mm-hmm. So I, I think it's important for a church, especially, to make sure that in that big philosophy of doing things, that you're unapologetic that the philosophy is not for sale. Mm-hmm. Like how it's going to be carried out, it's going to be talked about all the time yep. and evaluated, and and people share their opinions. But the actual philosophy. It's it's not up for you to come in and try to change it. So where you get in trouble is if you have staff members that it's not even like some malicious thing. It's just it, it's just a type of thing where they try to create their own sort of church within a church, mm-hmm. or think they're exempt from it and try to carry out their ideas of how it should be differently than actually how the, the overall church philosophy. And it, what happens is all of a sudden you start working. You have someone like working against you, mm-hmm. and that's not even how they see it. Again, it's not malicious, but they wind up working against your culture rather than helping fuel it. Yeah, and that's why these things are so critical because that is not going to allow your church to carry out the philosophy that you're existing for if there's competing mm-hmm. agendas and, and ways of doing things happening at the same time. Yeah. So out of Ashland's, um, you know, talk to the staff. One of the things that followed that was uh kind of well, i titled the the talk that i gave how our cultural mindset drives every environment at city church and so there were some things like we we are committed to um you know reaching the next generation we're devoted to making disciples we're submitting to the authority of scripture we are um gospel you know we, we are uh thinking about the gospel and all that we do like all of those things those don't change but our environments and the expression of those things is there's a very city church way to do that. Cause I think every church would say in some form or fashion that they're committed to, to doing those things. And so um, one of the things that, that, you know, we talked about and, and I'll kind of lay out the high level of my talk and then maybe we can talk about at least some of these things, but um, the, there were some like, it was sort of like a rules of the road for how we think about our culture and ministry environments 
And there were two assumptions that, that I made on the front end. One is evangelism and discipleship are not at odds with each other. So every ministry environment should assume that this is true and be planned accordingly. And then that no one invites someone to something that they themselves are not excited about. Huge. And so um, like those two things then are our assumptions for the rest of what we carry out. And sort of like the North Star as we think about like our culture and um, – and in and, and our environments is what Dean is known as the double promise. Can you kind of explain what yeah. the double promise is? So a double promise looks like this. Again, people only give you, if they give you a shot at all uh, for an invitation, people are very cynical, no second chance, no benefit for the doubt kind of culture we're in. Uh, I'm just convinced that all these churches that think that because they change their music style, it's going to reach all these lost people. It's like, why would a lost person ever care about that? Mm-hmm. Like, what, that a church has a different music style? I've never met a non-Christian in my life that's like, oh, wow, the pastor wears jeans, and, you know, and he tells them, I- I'm going to show up to church on Sunday. <laughs> I have not met that person yet. Uh, so I'm talking about unbelievers here. Right. So uh, I'm convinced the way that someone comes to church, there's always exceptions, but primarily by a large majority is a trusted friend invites them. The best way to reach someone to a church is on the arm of a trusted friend. So my goal as the lead pastor of this church is to reach our own people mm-hmm. to want to reach their friends. What I mean by that is create a church they're not just a part of, but a church that they love. So they know because they're the ones every day that are building relationships at work and in the neighborhood and wherever it could be, their workout class, on their all the different things, their Little League baseball team. Uh, but you're not going to invite someone to church that's only going to give you one shot to do it if you have hesitancies. So we have something called a double promise, and it's not on the website. You know, It's more of a, a, a internal I guess, value of doing things. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's not the kind of thing you really do put out there because it'd be kind of strange. It's more something that's practiced. The double promise is this. No disclaimer on the way to church. No apology on the way home. Mm-hmm. So no disclaimer would be like, hey, just so you know, <laughs> there's this girl who sings and she's really bad or she's really off pitch, but she, her dad you know, makes a lot of money and donates to the church. Or, yeah. or, or just so you know, he's, our pastor's a really good guy, you know, but every now and then he's going to say something a little racially insensitive. He doesn't mean it. You know, but, you know, but it's just, it's just, his, you know, he's from the South and he just gets all that crap, you know, no disclaimer on the way there and then no apology on the way home. I am so sorry. I know you're really shy. They have never made someone stand up and say their name before. And we're, I, I'm, I, I'm so sorry. Or, or I forgot to tell you that or you know, something along those lines. Or mm-hmm. I'm sorry. He's never endorsed a candidate from the pulpit before. Like, I, I know that that's, you know, that, that was your stereotype about churches. They were going to do like that kind of stuff. We don't want there to be any need for that mm-hmm. have we ever messed anything up before of course we yeah. have uh, so well, we're pretty very like apologetic when we mess that up yeah you know we're we apologize when we don't carry out the, the double promise mm-hmm. uh, but we actually think about it a lot and there'll be times in meetings where it comes up and someone will actually say that violates a double promise and again it's not always something as extreme as the examples i gave you know it could be something as simple as um you know if you invited a family to come to church and whatever reason we didn't have children's ministry happening that day, you know that 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 that'd be a that'd be a mm-hmm. you know oh my gosh I'm so sorry I didn't know your four year old had to sit through the entire service, you know that that type of thing we don't normally do that usually it's everybody in the, that type of thing so we take those things really seriously. Yeah, and I think like really that was what led to some of the culture class conversations initially is us realizing over you know a period of time and in not even in just one area it was like oh that was a violation of the double promise oh that was too oh. That was too. And so to kind of, uh, you know, just have a chance to work through and address those things so that we can, you know, when you, when you do notice it, you, it, it's a really helpful reminder to go, oh, we're off here. We need to, we need to course correct. And, and it takes someone point that out to you a lot of times, mm-hmm. you know, because a lot of times the ministry area you oversee or are a part of, you're so close to it and you genuinely came up with certain ideas or way of doing things. Maybe you're even excited about, and it's easy to not think the whole picture sometimes sure. about what we're first about. Yeah, which is which is trying to connect people who aren't here here. Yeah, yeah. So from that, there were uh, kind of a few a few things that we wanted to think about in an environment kind of mindset, and and this isn't exclusively like this is what it should look like, and this is the vibe, but just sort of like the the philosophical mindset. So we always think about the guest. Um, excellence is always expected. We need to minister in the world as it is, not as we want it to be. We calendar events with cultural currents, not against them. And then we need to know, like, 
all of our people. And then the last one was, it's possible to do a good thing and it not be the right thing. So um, for, for each of you, Ashlyn and for Dean, what, like, which of those is maybe either most important to you or do you feel like is, is most critical as you think about the culture of our church? Well, two things come to my mind. I, I don't know that I have one of those that you know, is the most important. But but when I listen to those and when I think about kind of what we're trying to capture with this sense of wanting to foster a missional culture and to say, you know, we we are a church that's trying to reach people. And Dean, you've talked before, you know, it sometimes trying to have a, a missional culture becomes at odds with, you know, taking care of your people internally or, you know, and, and those those kinds of the dichotomies get set up, but I think something that, and, and this would be included in all of those points, e- even down to something as specific as, you know, we, we calendar with cultural events and things like that. In all of that, what we're trying to do is actually, and this is where I think this kind of culture is really fun because it's not, um, and I promise I'm not, I'm like kind of talking around in circles to get where I'm trying to go. What we're not trying to do is to just have this culture that like, you know, is shallow or, or something like that. What we're trying to say is we actually, because we have a culture that is trying to reach people and connect people to the gospel, then we have to already become uh, people who understand and steward the culture that we're all already in, in our city. Mm -hmm. And so, and Andy Crouch talks about this in his book, Culture Making, which is fantastic, but he talks about stewarding cultural goods, you know? And so in all of those things, we're actually using pieces of the broader culture that we're all living in, in order to um, foster a culture within our own church that responds to the culture at large, which is very lost and, you know, spiritually speaking. And so I, that's something that I think as we've been going through this culture class, I've been trying to get at, like my brain has been trying to, to say, you know, wh- where is it that for some people you create that bridge between, um, you know, where people might think that there's a breakdown or, you know, we're not trying to say, okay, we have a missional culture at the neglect of something else. It's like, no, actually to be missional one, it's, if you, if you are interested in, if you're, if you're a deep thinker, or you're interested in kind of, you know, thinking big picture about these things or whatever, like you have to do a lot of deep thinking about what are the people around me like, and what is the culture around me like, and then how do I steward who I am and what God has called me to do, what he's placed in my life. Um, how do I become, you know, a student of the culture around me and then steward those, those cultural experiences well for the sake of mission. So there, there actually is a ton of um, depth to that. Uh, to, to be able to live and work in that. Um, but then also in these very practical ways, what we're trying to say is just that we're going to steward what is around us, you know, what we have and what we live in um, in order to connect with people, to, to basically understand what, what people have going on in their lives and, and how we can leverage the life of the church to, to go out and reach them, to connect them, knowing that they're not going to just, you know, unless you really have a massive life crisis going on or something, very rarely does somebody just pull into Sessions Road and say, you know, I'm here, connect to me on a Wednesday morning, right? Tragedy might be the example or the exception to that, that, that prompts something like that. But, you know, that's very few and far between. And so um, I don't even know where I was going with that other no, than just good. to say, I think that that's what comes to mind when I hear those things is, you know, even even something as specific as, you know, some of those points, that all is a part of trying to, um, trying to, to build a culture that reaches the culture at large by understanding that culture and then living differently within it. Yeah. I think that's the key is that we really do want to be an alternative to the world in terms of what we believe and what we say, Like you said something distinct and different to it. And I, I have no interest in any kind of missional model that waters down the message. Uh, because I don't think that's ultimately reaching people. You know, I am interested in taking deep truths and explaining them in a way that the everyday Tallahassee person can grasp and understand. And that's not me insulting their intelligence. It's just me not expecting them to have a grasp on every theological term in the same way if I went into their world, <laughs> I wouldn't have a you know a grasp of every single term they might use at work or, or, or in different things they are excited about or value. I mean, I, I listened to some people talking about the new Batman movie today, and I had absolutely no idea what they were talking about. They were talking about, I really had no, because that's just not my world. Now, would I go see Batman? I mean, not by myself, 
kind of to the point. If somebody invited me, maybe you mm-hmm. know, if I, if I was, I, I'd think about it. I just don't care. Like I think I'll talk great. So you don't have a favorite Batman. I don't even know who they are. <laughs> like, I you know, I mean, like, it's so like, aren't they all Batman? Yeah, I, I just, yeah. I, I said, okay, so I learned something. I, I made a comment. I was like, yeah, I'm not really into all the Marvel stuff. And someone said, he, Batman's not Marvel. I was like. What does that even mean? I thought they're all Marvel. <laughs> it's like, isn't there just a superhero and I, category? Yeah, and I'm not even being funny. I have no idea. Here, this will put it on your terms. Yeah. Marvel is WWE, and then DC, which is Batman, is WCW. So competitors. Yeah, okay. basically. Okay, so, okay. <laughs> so, yeah, so, but, but at the same time, like, I would have, I'd probably be asking questions. Like, like what's that? What? Mm-hmm. So I, I think that when you just simply want to explain and be clear and be sensitive towards and consider it towards visitors and guests. In some segments of Christian culture, there is this conclusion that, oh, you must be shallow, you must be seeker sensitive, you must be. It's like, no, we just consider the guests. Well, yeah. sorry, I didn't want to cut you off. Because so, some do do that. You yeah. Know, yeah, some churches cer- certainly do that in the name of being seeker. I just don't think that works. And I don't think that actually reaches people. I think it just draws a crowd. And I don't want to do that either. Yeah. So something, and Alex, you're really the person who this sort of exercise, you have kind of led this in our staff, but I've never really connected these two things together. We've talked before about lead and lag measures, Mm -hmm. you know, and what I'm hearing in, and I'm going to let you explain lead and lag measures because you'll be much more succinct than I will. But, uh, but what I hear as I'm listening to Dean is in the kind of in the broader conversation we're talking a lot about the action steps or the practical outworkings that we have towards building a type of culture. So Dean, when you're talking about explaining something or being accessible or being guest friendly, like those are all practical steps that we take in response to, at the end of the day, we want a culture where like the cultural marker of that to me would be that people can come be welcomed into the life of the church and can grow from infancy and spirituality into maturity yes you know and that's i mean that what is more biblical than that you know and so i think that's an interesting thing is that sometimes we we say what we want the church to be and then we jump to kind of some of the practical things that we do for that but people if you only live in that world which i'm not saying that even there's nothing wrong with in fact it's it's very good to be able to break things down for people explain it to them like you said it's not you don't sit in, you know, school and say, well, I'm, my intelligence is so insulted because you're having to teach me this thing. You know, it's like, this is literally the whole point of why you're here. Um, so, but, I, but I guess in my mind, that just helps me think about it better too, that when we say, okay, here are certain things we're going to do that other people might see as shallow or just as doing too much or, you know, I don't know, compromising the integrity of whatever, who knows. I think what we're saying is, right, but if you have a culture in mind, like if you want people to come to your church and feel comfortable and feel welcomed and know that they can openly, you know, work through their sin, work through what they don't know of the scriptures of God, and they can learn those things in the community and the fellowship of believers, if that's the culture that you want, then you have to do certain things to be able to foster that culture. And that's like the essence of what we're trying to talk about. Yeah, and I think like, the the idea that to go back to your kind of like lead and lag measure and you know oh well, we want to build a church where people feel welcome well like okay how do we know if we did that more people came so that's your lag measure right like it's mm-hmm. like oh i set a goal to reach a thousand people as a church and it's like well okay we're going to be really friendly well, okay so what does like that mean? so how like, do i do that yeah. and then you've got to define that and so maybe that's hey we want every you know the lead measure we want every member to invite one friend every week. And then because, you know, and then there's a, there's a bajillion and things. feel comfortable doing it. Exactly. And I was going to say, there's That's a bajillion the things me. about how they feel good about inviting and how their experience is once they come and how do they stick and how do you explain things in a way that they can grow so that they do feel like, oh, hey, this was a place where, where I belong. But it's like, you know, we can sit and go, we have a goal to, you know, baptize X number of people this year. Let me like our goal right now is 60. Well, okay. 
if we don't ever have a conversation about baptism, if we don't ever talk about it in a connect class, if we don't ever talk about it, if we don't ever treat people who take that step in a way that honors that decision to follow Jesus, you know, in obedience, then like we're probably never going to get there. And so to be able to define what those things are and then figure out, okay, what can we do to influence these things? And in the kind of cultural context that we're doing, like how, how do we do that? What is the, the city church way of, you know, whatever, what is the, you know, church yeah. of, and believing in your way of doing things, mm-hmm. believing in what you value, not feeling like you also have to apologize for who you are as a church. Yeah. Cause we're not going to be a church for everybody. Mm-hmm. I, I wish we would be, uh, but if you have a, like if as you want just a church that simply is just going to be more just an academic, you know, lecture center, you know, every Sunday, like the, the, the we see that as a seminary classroom. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, we're going to also talk about real things and we're going to talk about real deep truths of theology. And we're going to hopefully challenge your thinking and stretch your imagination and, and all of the, those important matters, but it's all going to be in the context of the fact we believe that faith comes by hearing. We want the message to be heard. That's just from like the preaching side, mm-hmm. uh, side of things. But in terms of how the culture plays into everything else, we want our members to to see a huge win being having someone come to church. Mm-hmm. Like I think about Bryce Hill. Uh, he invited someone to go to church and was waiting outside in the parking lot for them to pull up. Yep. You know, it, what, he wasn't going, well, I'll, if I see, I see, uh, I want to see my church friends first. Or I had, to, I, I had to tend to my family right this second. Mm-hmm. No, it was like, We've this got is a, a team of deal. greeters that he'll, yeah, he'll be like, greeted. This is a big deal. Like, my friend's coming. I'm going to mm-hmm. meet him out front, walk his family in. Yeah, yeah. It's just that, that sounds so basic. That's not common in church world. Yeah. Because it's about me and my family and my friends and getting my seat and my coffee and just getting in on. Now, Bryce got there early <laughs> and was on the lookout for his friend because that was a huge deal to him. Yeah. You know, that his friend was coming and that kind of stuff really matters when one of the things that so we have a staff member who's a, who's with her husband about to move and um she in a q a tuesday we were talking about uh, she asked a question of like hey as i'm getting ready to leave and city church is sort of like i mean she she joined as a college student it's like she's she came on staff as a resident um like she's this has been the church that sort of raised her in a sense um and so she asked the question like how do i find a church that has the city church culture like how can i kind of export that to where i'm going and how can i like how can i think about church culture in the church that i'm looking for and i think one of the things to and this was my my answer to her and i'd love to you know hear y'all's thoughts on that too but um was that like the city church culture isn't actually like a look or a feel no. or a, like a style, um, but it's who we are and how we operate and what drives that. In a mindset. Yeah. yeah. And so like, I just think that's important. Like you can have a pipe organ and a chancel choir and, um, you know, a, I don't a, even know what that is. a pastor in a robe, you know, and you can have great evangelistic yeah. You know, I culture care that those cares about all those things. It's and, not defined by style. Yeah. So if you're yeah. looking for, you know, drums and an electric guitar you might miss the culture that's actually best for you yeah and sometimes when folks define excellence they define it by style it's like no 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 it's not a style you know it's it's a posture it's a uh it's a value uh it means that we are going to work for the glory of the lord and make sure the things we do are not lazy or half tail that they actually are you know done for the glory of god and that is not defined by style at all it's defined instead by how we work hard to make sure the things that we're putting out and producing uh, are are things that w- Jerry Fall used to always say. Jerry Fall Senior, uh, when I was at Liberty, he used to always say he believes that if it's Christian, it should be better. And he didn't mean that in a showy or flashy way. He meant just in a how we take things more seriously, quality kind of way. So he would say, for example, if you're a Christian who owns a restaurant, your restaurant should have better service than any other restaurant. If you're a Christian working at a law firm, no one should work harder and better. You know, and more honestly, and, you know, and, yeah. and and produce more work in a tr- quality manner than you, because you're you have a greater purpose than just income, or, or just your talents, or just your dreams. You you work for the glory of God. So I think that's how excellence should be viewed. Mm-hmm. Like if it's Christian, it should be done better. Yeah, I think like I mean, because if you define it as a style, like there's going to be a concert at the civic center that's going to blow us out of the water in terms of quote excellence. If we're defining it in the way that Zach Brown defines it. Yeah. They have a 40 person crew just for the lights. Right. Exactly. <laughs> you know, you know? I mean, like, so yeah. it's like, we're never going to have a more excellent show 
than Zach Brown Band, like which Church is in a show and all those things. All those disclaimers, like, yeah. We're, you know, <laughs> like 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 that's never going to match up. But to your point, like that's not that's not what's defining excellence. It's the the, the posture of the heart and how and why we're working uh, the way that we are. Um, one of the one of the quotes that gets said a lot around City Church actually came from Bob Evans, who was a pastor here in town who recently retired. And he says, "You have to minister in the world as it is, not as you want it to be." How does that quote impact the way that we think about the culture that we're ministering? You know, no one modeled that better than Bob <laughs> either. Uh, it's it's that. Let's say, for example, that um, we think that people maybe don't uh, pray enough. The, the way you do that, rather than say, okay, we're going to have a meeting next week and we're all going to pray for an hour. You know, th- like they don't pray at all. <laughs> That's not the world. Instead, we want to teach them how to pray. You know, we want to, want to get them started. And maybe their prayer is 45 seconds. <laughs> you know, like that, that's a quick example. But, but that's like 45 seconds more yeah, than they prayed the week it's before. Like you're, yeah, the solution is not that you go from zero to 100. You know, it's that you hit the world where it is and then you start from that. That's just from like a Christian perspective of discipleship. Mm-hmm. Uh, but in a world as we want it to be, it's like, okay, like if you want to, you're not going to be able to reach. If the world is not Christian, you can't treat them like they are and expect them to act like they are. That's a very Jesus-like approach and model. Like he expected those who were religious to have different hearts than they did, mm-hmm. you know, and that, that was, so he laughs out at the Pharisees for, for that. He didn't expect the woman at the well to, to suddenly, you know, instantly when he met her to be living a holy life, but he pointed her and led her to one, mm-hmm. you know? And so I, th- I think that's kind of part of it. Ashley, what, what do you think about that? About ministering to the world as it is rather than yeah. as it should be. Um, I want to hear your thoughts on that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, I would say two things that come to mind. One, I think you have to have, to me, this just connects directly to the Great Commission. Um, We talked about this in my equip class. uh, Whenever this episode goes out, it'll probably be two weeks from now. I'm like, what is time? Um, But talking about how when Jesus said, you know, go and make disciples, it, the, that that whole statement of the Great Commission, he's he's saying, as you go, like as you go about your life, he's not necessarily saying go to the other side of the world, you know, you know, or in. But he's saying, as you go, you're going to make disciples. That's what you've been called to do. And then he immediately tells the disciples how they're going to do that. That's like a we talked about. It's a participle phrase, baptizing and teaching. And so ministering to the world as it is rather than you want it to be means that you have to have a, a sense of reality around you of what you're working with. Um, and then, so so in a way, you have to really embrace that call of disciple making um, and, and ministering to people. But then you also have to be very in touch with where they are, which is, you know, which is what Dean is saying. Um, and then you know, knowing that you already have the tools to do that ministry as a believer, you know, and you're indwelt by the Holy Spirit, um, then then you go and do those things. And so in a sense, it, I think you have to have a, a big understanding of the call, but you can't then overcomplicate it because it's something that is just literally as you go about your life, this is what you're called to do. And so in, a, in another way, it's profoundly simple. I actually think in a way that we probably are not very always very well prepared to do because we're such consumers you Mm -hmm. know we need programs and all kinds of you know things things, yeah uh, around to feel like we're doing something when when actually I think it looked very different at the time that you know Jesus spoke those words um and so yeah I I think I think there's that I mean and and there's also a sense of I mean if you want to speak in you know, more businessy terms, I guess. There's a sense of understanding. I mean, like we talk in Tallahassee about, you know, if you think Tallahassee, you're going to get Tallahassee results, which is a different conversation than the one we're having here. But I think that sense of understanding like the status quo or like where people are comfortable living at and uh, to draw on what Seth Godin says, like the thing that is going to actually move that is culture. And so if you build a better culture than the one that people are living in, you know what I mean? I mean, I think that's another thing that's exciting about um, you know, you can certainly do this outside of Christianity, but within the church, like you get to be a part of building a culture that's better than the one that other people are living in. Mm-hmm. And yeah. that, that's something that no matter who you are, that's worth 
that's worth giving your life for, you know, that's totally. fun and it's really hard work. But so I think in terms of ministering to the world as it is, like you have to be able to see the world as it is. Like you can't look at it with rose colored glasses, um, but you also have to have great hope in it and see the potential uh, and then say, yeah, let's go build a culture that's way better and invite people to be a part of that. And that's fun. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I, I like to say, I, I like to add to the Bob quote, you know, where Bob says, you don't reach the world as it, as uh, you want it to be. You reach the world as it is. And I would say, yes, amen. You reach the world, not as you want it to be, to get it to where you want it to yeah. be. And, and that would be a, a culture that's redeemed, mm-hmm. right? And, 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 and it all goes back to people, right? Like that's why I tell some of our younger ministry interns and like residents and, and folks like that. I'm like, guys, if you're in ministry because you really want to preach or because you really love theology, I, I'd, I'd point you somewhere else. Make that, make that a hobby or something. You know? Yeah, like, or go like, into academia. Yeah, or... like, like it's people. You, know, like you need to be in ministry because it's first and foremost about people. And you can take the things you love, like theology and doctrine and, you know, and, and, and preaching and apply it into the actual ministry of people. But mm-hmm. us back to, that's a big part of our culture. It's always been about people. That's been really important for me. Like, I, I'm, you're just, I'm, I'm just not going to be the guy that's like in an office all day and behind four doors. Like, I'm going to be out with people. But that, I, you saying that, that is, I think, another great challenge and a great call of the church is that, like, we don't live in a culture that inherently values people, I would say. You're right. You know, I mean, so even thinking about a college student who's coming up, you know, if you, if you go to a four-year university or, um, you know, or not, I don't think it really matters, but, but generally the culture that you live in, you know, it's a lot of times it's transactional, it's consumer, um, consumer focused, you know, and and you're living and breathing that, and we live in a Western individualistic society. And so everything, even if somebody on the outside is not saying my whole entire life is about me, you know what I mean? It, that's really how you're formed, Mm -hmm. you know, in in a lot of ways to think. And so to, um, I actually think there is a, there is an opportunity to have grace when people are maybe struggling because we, we all get there. We all are selfish, but when people are struggling to be able to see what Dean is talking about or, or hear, you know, and receive to, to be consistent there. <laughs> um, uh, there, there's an opportunity also to have grace to say, you know, the Christian life is dying to self. And so in the times when I'm tempted to get caught up in the work or the programs or the designing of something, because that sometimes is really fun, you mm-hmm. know, but it can't come at the expense of, people like at the end of the day what you're building is for people it's not just for you um it's not just to look at you know it's it's to serve people like it's i mean going back to the andy crouch thing you're stewarding the culture that you're building and you're stewarding stewarding the goods that you have and so um yeah i i think that's important that's well said um last question on this topic uh so as we've gone through seven weeks of culture class dean one of the questions you asked on the panel yesterday was um if it you know if if the things that we had talked about felt like they kind of hit you between the eyes, you know, and, and for everybody, I think there was some part of, you know, one or many of those talks that it was like, Oh, I need to, I need to check myself there. I need to, I need to, to adjust. And, you know, how should like, let's say somebody's listening to this, they take their team through a, a culture class. Like how do you do that in a way where if somebody either is like on the team is, is off on culture or you feel like, Oh man, this is just an attack on me. Like, how do you think through that, flesh that out in a way that like gives grace and loves one another, but also pushes people towards the culture that either you are, or you're trying to create. Well, the meeting's going to be, the classes are going to be a waste of time if you actually don't get specific about certain things. It was just all 30,000 foot, and that needs to be part of it. you got to get the philosophy side, the big picture, but you got to actually bring up some stuff, you know, and then be willing to have a follow-up, you know. Um, and if it's, like, really a torpedo, I would probably tell the person beforehand uh, that you're going to talk about it. Like, if it's, like, brutal, yeah. <laughs> you know, or, or you're going to blindside yeah, somebody. Nobody should be surprised yeah, in a group. Yeah, but, like, same time, like, you've got to talk about those kind of things. And then have follow-ups. Like your culture class is only going to go so far if it, it just ends at the meeting. Mm-hmm. You know, it doesn't have like a part two. And part two is not in front of the whole group, but to work out those kind of things. And then hopefully those that maybe if your organization has kind of direct report kind of people, hopefully your direct report people are savvy enough with the culture and are part of the culture. They should be in that role if they're not. Mm-hmm. Uh, that um, they can on their own also with the, with their teams can, can have those kind of conversations and those things. So I think you just got to be specific. And you got to talk about the things that if, if you've drifted, you've got to point out what, where's the drift 
And um, I, I talked about specifically, you know, about mm-hmm. some certain things, you know. And, and so I think then you bring it back to the center and help people actually see what that is and what that looks like. So I just think you got to be really clear. And that hurts a little bit. It stings a little bit. But if you're the one that's off base, like, it's going to need to sting for a second to to get you back. Like, mm-hmm. you know, like the invisible fence, you know, the first couple of times a dog goes through it, it yelps, right? And then it learns, I'm not going to go over there. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, sort of thing. Is that still a thing, invisible fences? I think so. Yeah, yeah my was... neighbors have one. Okay. <laughs> the dog sits outside and barks all day I was going to say, long. Ashlyn hears a lot of yelping, apparently. Yeah. Uh, no, I would, I would agree with that. I think if you are a leader in your organization, so you have, you know, some, some sense of, of influence and, and, you know, position, um, I think you have to be unapologetic about even if you, because I've had these conversations with staff members and I've experienced this myself, even if you at times are uncertain about, you know, your capacity to do X, Y, or Z, I think you have to be really confident and own the fact that if you know that you're a culture fit, like own that, you know what I mean? And and take responsibility because that's the thing. It's easy. It's very easy to like point the finger at someone or something and say, that's not a culture fit or that's not what we're trying to do. Like literally that anybody can do that. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like you can walk into a store and be like, that, that doesn't work for me. You know what I mean? But to take responsibility for it and to say, I'm going to, I'm going to have ownership over this because I, I know that I get the culture here. Or I know that I'm a part of this. I'm bought in. And so now I'm going to see it as my responsibility to help other people grow in that and, and to foster this culture and to protect it. Um, that's a lot of work. And so I think if, if you are a leader specifically, um, you have to have that kind of, you know, level of ownership. I mean, there have been times, you know, certainly in my role, you know, and Alex as us as executive directors, where I've certainly doubted, you know, my ability to do X, Y, or Z or to, you know, be good at this or that. But I have always been pretty confident that I get what we're trying to do as a church and I get the kind of culture that we want to work in, you mm-hmm. know, because I like I'm because I'm a person here, too. You know what I mean? It's like that. that I want to also work in a great culture. Yep. Um, and so, yeah, I think not to say the same thing over and over again, but just I think if you're a leader, you don't have to be, you know, a leader. You can you can be anywhere in your organization. But if you get that. Um, even if it creates conflict or even if, you know, somebody like rubs up against that, um, at the end of the day, generally you're in the seat that you're in because someone has seen that and they have entrusted, you know, that responsibility to you. Uh, and so steward that. Yeah. And I think like you're in, I mean, for anybody, like the, the temptation is to drift away from who we're trying to be. Like it just, I mean, you know, it's like if you get in an inner tube on like, uh, you know, Rosemary beach and you just let the current take you, you might end up in Panama city. Actually, like, Oh no. Um, I was going to say that sounds great to me. Which would be tragic. You're like, wait, I was Sitting in on Ro- an inner two in Rosemary beach is like literally my version. Right. Of it. It's like, I was in Rosemary. <laughs> Why am I in Panama city? Ooh, no offense. What a rough, <laughs> <laughs> rough, <laughs> rough transition. Well, no one but, swam out with a buoy. Like no one sent up a flare, but that's a drift. Right. And, and, and it's easy to drift. Cause you're like, Oh man, I'm in Rosemary. Life is good. It's 30 a woo wee. You know, it's like, what, where did these go karts and airbrush t shirts dance come from? Exactly. Why does everyone around me have a, Do I have a hair wrap like, now? I, I, yeah, we ain't in Kansas anymore. Okay. Like, so it's easy to drift. Um, I cannot stand Panama City. <laughs> but, but, but it's, it's difficult to, to, you know, to, to hold the line. And so sometimes, like, even if you're a culture carrier, there's going to be times where you're just off. And so um, trust that the people on your team and the culture that you're building together have enough respect for you as a person and you have enough trust with them to go, hey, like, yeah, that kind of stung, but I know you're willing to say that to me. You're willing to be specific, you know, because you see me as a culture fit, you care about me, and and this matters to, to what we're trying to do. So um, local on tap. Uh, as we go back to gas, um, <laughs> what a great, this what a podcast, great segue. Hey, back this, to gas. This podcast has uh, been straight s- gas. Somebody posted um, today, the only place where you can still get gas for a dollar thirty eight is Taco Bell. <laughs> that is that. awful. That's funny. Oh I loved gosh. it. Shout out to our neighbor across the street. Never um, been. <laughs> all right. Um, what is your favorite gas station in Tallahassee? <laughs> So wow. I, I so I think if if you grew up here, 
or anyways, I guess you live here. Now. I mean, you, everybody kind of has their official like home gas station. Uh-huh. So my like home base was forever was the uh, Bannerman Road. Called Sing Store back then. Yeah. Uh, the, now saying. now it's a Circle K I'm at Bannerman sorry. and uh, Thomas Little Road. This is before there was all that shopping out there. And this yeah. is pre Target and even pre Publix. I mean everything, pre Childs, all those things. So that was the, the only civilization between like I ten and Georgia <laughs> was that gas yeah, station. It really was. So that was like my home gas station. Mm-hmm. So that was kind of it. It forever. <laughs> now I don't have a home station. gas station anymore. Based on where I live, like there's just like a, like random ones. Yeah. Uh, so, but my favorite gas station in Tallahassee, as I deeply think about this, is probably the Pan on Capitol Circle. Interesting. Yeah, big fan of that gas station. Didn't it just change? I think it's like Inland Gas now. Yeah. Is it? See, I haven't yeah. been in a couple weeks. Across from like Lowe's. Yeah. Yeah. They yeah. changed it. They changed. It's no longer I'm, a I guess pan. I'm not a very good fan that I didn't even um, know that. Yeah, that's all right. I just yeah. drove by like huh. a couple yeah. days ago and saw it. Yeah, so. fan, fan of the pan. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Why Big pan fan. Big um, pan fan. Ashlyn? Um, I, well, now I'm like so thrown off. I like the McKenzie Mart on Capitol Circle. That's a good one. Because it's like, you know, big and like just lots of space. I don't like when I'm like right up on somebody like getting their gas. Not to like, be confused with the McKenzie gas station on North Monroe and Sessions. Yeah, not that one. <laughs> not but they're, that one. they're all in the same family. But um, I, I mean, I'll also go to that one too. I don't, I also do not have a home gas station. <laughs> um, but I feel like. I like the McKinsey Mart. It's nice and clean, and it's easy to get in and out of for the most part, I guess. Um, it's pretty close to your house, too. I don't do a lot of... I'm not, like, especially now that I don't drink Diet Coke, like, I don't really go into convenience stores as much anymore. Yeah, so, it's like a thing of the past for Yeah, me. It's, I mean, it's just purely it's purely transactional now for me, visiting gas stations. There's no, there's no real experience to it anymore. Jacob Baldry? Um, I think the one I probably most frequent is the new uh, shell next to the KFC on North Monroe in Callaway. Oh yeah, that's like the re- like the Red Hills Market. I think yes. it's called. Oh, yeah, that one's, that nice. one's kind of bougie. Kind of bougie on a hill. You see, can, you can see everything, which is nice and safe. Gas so. station on a hill. Not <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I'm Team Costco uh, oh, because yeah. you know. That's like that's like my I mean that that's where I want to go when I get gas. Not because it's like a great gas station, but they're cheap. We have um, a Costco membership, but I think I've only actually been once in my life. Dude, it's a Chrissy thing. I love the club. See, it, it surprises me a little bit because I do feel like if you're an extrovert, Costco can can be a lot of fun. But we're just not the family that goes shopping together. Yeah, it's like totally yeah. like like it's just I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, Chrissy just like has her list, knows what she wants. <laughs> goes doesn't want you adding to it <laughs> no, i just like yeah it's just yeah you kinda... would definitely be the person who's like ooh, a tv and this and yeah. This. oh yeah like, <laughs> totally i mean like i go to target maybe twice a year with, you know, yeah. like it's because we're already out there and she has to stop at it yeah That's um, funny. but, but I, didn't, I didn't know they had gas at costco they do awesome um and it's like yeah it, like the pumps always are nice and it's it's good it's you, you can fill up on either side because the hose stretches it's nice i'm a big fan but my home gas station is the walmart like murphy express oh, yeah. on uh carry forest. carry forest like that's yeah that's usually where where i'm at because i do the little fuel rewards thing and every once in a while so we'll surprise and delight get 10 cents off oh, nice you, you, you fill go. up enough so yeah. yep that's uh that's it so well, next time we'll be an international podcast. International podcast. Ashlyn is wheels up. Wow. Crazy. In five days. Yeah. No pressure. Um, Here we so. go. All right. Well, with that note, have a great day. See you next week. God save the queen. Thanks for listening to The Local Dive, a podcast diving into deep and shallow musings about Christ, the church, and culture. Don't forget to subscribe and leave a review wherever you listen to podcasts. You can follow The Local Dive on social media and continue the conversation with us on Instagram and Twitter at The Local Dive Pod.